thing. So, uh, good day, Richard Norton. <laughs> <laughs> good day or good evening here. What is it? Uh, seven o'clock at night on a Sunday evening in Melbourne, Australia. Yes, and it's uh, what is it? Ten a.m. in the UK. So you're in the future again. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So we'll start off. I'll show the clip from the teaser trailer from the on one of your upcoming movies, and then we'll discuss the others later. So here's Black Creek. Okay. So there's you hitting poor little Cynthia Rothrock again. <laughs> deserved it, Gareth. She deserved it. <laughs> you knew what I knew. No, it's uh, yeah, same. Yeah, but look at the results. Same with Lady Dragon and a few of the others. I, I get a few licks in, but then obviously I get my come up and set the end. <laughs> I, we always laugh about playing a bad guy. Is you, you always get beaten up in the end, and you never, you never get the girl. You never get the lead lady. You know what I mean? No. Which is sad because I always say we're not bad, just misunderstood. <laughs> yes, you're a Disney villain now, aren't you? Misunderstood. Misunderstood. Yeah, not evil, <laughs> despite the things you do. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> in spite of that, <laughs> there's a reason for everything. I'll justify it all. <laughs> <laughs> so yes you very kindly to agree to go through 10 clips of some of your big fight scenes nah, give us your opinion on what they are you think about them now yeah well yeah because goodness me how <laughs> long ago right starting off with octagon 1979 it's crazy right it's crazy how time's gone how you know as my wife says how do we get to here meaning the egg <laughs> we are now at you know Yes, I'm still fighting fit, luckily. <laughs> so I'll bring up the clips. So uh, I'll run the countdown. I'll move my mouse and then we'll start with the octagon that we assume is you because you're wearing a mask. <laughs> well, you, you know, the character was supposed to be Asian, obviously, because of the training camp and the ninja theme. So uh, that's why they came up with the, the headdress. They even darkened my eyes out. And uh, But the reason I got the role was really because of having worked with, you know, done some demonstrations with Chuck the previous year in Australia. And he knew right. I could handle all the weapons. We were training every morning together at his house. And he asked me if I would play his main nemesis, um, which is how the role came about. And, and it was fantastic. I mean, we... Sh that was a long fight and a long shoot. We shot all through the night in a place called Indian Dunes in Los Angeles. Um, yeah. And and pretty much, you know, not a lot of not a lot of inserts and everything. You can see the camera pretty much pulls back and we just go through everything. We did a lot of masters of this fight. And uh, it worked out well because, you know, Chuck and I had figured the fight out in the back in his backyard at his house. Right. And uh, with his brother, Aaron, Aaron Norris. So we figured out a lot of the fights and the moves. Because Chuck's not a weapons man. He hadn't handled swords particularly or whatever. So the choreography, of course, had to suit his ability in that regard. Um, but, but again, I, I, I think it just turned out so well. Mm. You, you see that part there where I dropped down and the side... I had, they were actually metal side, and I had they were very sharp pointed, which a side generally aren't, but they had points on them. Right. And Chuck's Chuck had to bring his hand up to you know with the sword and block the size coming down when I dropped down on top of him when he's lying on his back. And one take, he missed the block, and I stopped the side like half an inch away from his eyeballs. And he's, his eyes are wide open. I jokingly said, I said, um, Chuck, how does Richard Norton karate school sound to you as opposed <laughs> to Chuck Norris? And he just laughed. He said, yeah, yeah, that sounds really good. It was just a funny moment. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, the yeah. good thing for, for Chuck and I, because we trained a lot already every morning in his house, I knew his timing. He was aware of my timing, which, of course, always helps, you know, when performing choreography with something like this. Yeah. There he goes. Three kicks. <laughs> and he gets the last one. Could you see in that mask all right? No, you know what? It was very, very... I had no peripheral vision. You know, I could only see what was directly in front of me, uh, which made it very difficult. And again, thank God I know I knew the movements pretty well with Chuck because we'd both worked them out, as opposed to getting there on the day and having somebody else choreograph it and show the, and the moves to us. That would have right. been very difficult. But the fact that we were sort of working them out together and everything, at least... Uh, I was able to get through it that way. Yeah, because it is a worry when you're trying to react to spinning heel kicks and everything like that. It's You do need that peripheral sort of um, or situational awareness to handle that. But we, we were okay. You know, we, we managed. No injuries. <laughs> on. Ah, is that you on fire? Or No, 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 no. <laughs> it was definitely, everything else was me except that. That was a stuntman. And back in those days, they had a little oxygen tank in there and a very padded suit. Because, you know, a fire burn like that is actually a very, very dangerous thing. If you didn't have a, a particular mask and everything, an oxygen mask, they do it differently now. But back then, and you took a deep breath in, you could just end up incinerating your whole insides. Um oh, right. And, you know, Octagon was my first movie in the States. I had worked on a movie here in Australia, but I was very green to the whole worth, the idea of stunts and fight scenes for movies. So especially doing a fire burn, that's, that's a very, very um, particular skill that certain stunt people have, you know, and for, yeah. again, for obvious reasons, if it goes wrong, it could be quite catastrophic, but... Mm. No, and, and, you know, this, again, this is my first movie in the U.S., um, as I said, working with with Aaron, with Chuck's brother, to put it all together. As you probably know, I there was four, four of us that played ninja throughout that whole movie. So anytime you see somebody go splat on the ground, it's probably me or one of three others, you know, going up the side of the hotel and all sorts of stuff. We did all of the ninja work. Plus, I played the character of Long Legs. As you know, there's a character with the old 70s moustache and everything, you know, and the long blonde hair uh, that I played where you could actually see me playing a terrorist. And i tell you a little interesting um, side note of that. I'm not sure we, we talked about this, but I, I walk up behind Chuck and I put my hand on his shoulder and I say, you go when he tells you you can. Know what I mean? Chuck kicks me in the groin, like he lifts his heel, you know, oh. and I end up turning around going, shit, shit. Well, you know, you know, an interesting uh, backstory to that, the choreography for that was figured out by John Belushi. <laughs> right. And I fly of fame because I was, uh, I was working as a personal bodyguard for John. And oh. I was also training a bit. We were getting ready to do the Blues Brothers movie. And I had the script and I showed John, you know, and I asked him about it and he said, oh, oh, here's what you should do. And he basically came up with this thing about saying shit, shit, and walking around in a circle with my hand out because he kicked me in the groin. And I think that's pretty funny, right, that John's actually had a little bit of choreography. Yeah. He should have a choreography credit for that one. <laughs> Assistant stunt coordinator, John Belushi, yes. That looked yeah. good on his resume. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's funny. I never forgot that. I thought that's a bit of history right there. John was great, you know, but that's a whole other story, of course. The good thing for me on, uh, like, Octagon, you know, it, it it introduced me to a whole different world, you know, and I thank Chuck for that opportunity because when I went to the U.S., I had no aspirations of doing movies, you know. It wasn't even in my radar because I was – going over to work as a uh, bodyguard for um, Linda Ronstadt, James Taylor, and a few other bands. And it's only through working with Chuck every morning at his house and him getting ready for that movie that that opportunity came up. And the rest is history because that, again, set me on a whole different career path, uh, which which I'll never forget. And, you know, there's people like Philip and Simon Ree were on that. Now, anyone knows I, they're doing incredibly 
big movies as fight coordinators, stunt coordinators, um, best of the best, you know, movies. So they were, you would almost call them bit players, Gerald Okamura, you know, who is a bit mm. of a legend in martial arts. And of course, I got to meet uh, Yamashita Sensei, Tadashi Yamashita. He uh, was Sakura, who plays my boss, an amazing martial artist. And I got to work, you know, do lessons with um, Tadashi for a number of years after Octagon. So I guess it, it was like a big pro playground of amazing martial artists. And I remember thinking, God, how good is this? I'm still doing what my passion is, you know, playing around with weapons and throwing kicks and everything else and actually getting paid for it and getting to meet some incredible martial artists on, along the way. So I just wanted to say that. I mean, that's that's what's so memorable about Octagon for me, you know. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, some big names then now. <laughs> yeah. Because, yeah, I see G Gerald all the time on a Instagram. He's always up for something. <laughs> You're <laughs> great. He's great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Little picture of him there from <laughs> the right. trouble with China. Right. Let's go. Uh, play. Let's have a look. The magic crystal. There he is. <laughs> Fighting center again. Yeah, this was 1986. <laughs> my my character's name was Karov. I'm a I'm a Russian KGB person, supposedly versed in all different martial arts, of which I'm not. Um, <laughs> there's a couple of moves where I had to do that are very Chinese based that were not my thing, mm. and we, we had big laughs about trying to figure some of that stuff out, but. Again, we were talking. I was trying to remember the name of the choreographer in this movie, but he was he was amazing, and he really. I think these are some of the best fights that I've done in Magic Crystal. And I thankfully they asked me about any weapons I could handle, and I said, "Well, I, I really like Okinawan Sai, you know, those sort of oh, short yes. kind of swords, which obviously you'll see in one of the clips. I think you have when I fight Andy Lau." And um, so it was, you know, and he put a lot of the choreography together on the spot and the way we went. And uh, it was just, it was very creative and, and, and just enjoyable when I got to see the end result of the fights. There's Andy Lau. Andy Lau, of course, is as big as Jackie Chan or got to be. Andy, that was one of his first movies after coming, uh, after doing a lot of television. And um, he was great, you know, fun to work with. There's the side that comes in here. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll tell you another little thing, that the costume. We shot this in an underground kind of studio. It was probably about 120 degrees Fahrenheit <laughs> most of the time. They only had one costume. So after oh. certain takes, I was just drenched in sweat. And this will give you a nice little thrill. They had They just basically took it off and ironed it dry and I'd put it back on and away we would go again. See, everybody thinks on a movie you'll have like 10 different wardrobe changes. <laughs> Not the case with something like this. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I just really laughed about that because it was just so hot. It was so humid. And you can see it's frenetic action that's going on. So yeah, it's covered in sweat. And, again, it, they ironed my costume dry. So that was fun. Also in this one, I think you've you've got another clip, haven't you, from Magic yeah. Crystal? Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about yeah, that then. A couple of little incidents <laughs> that happened, but the funny part for us is the little alien that's right up in the background there. It was basically <laughs> a paper mache thing, and since then I, we we would never stop cracking up. We're like, oh my god, what the hell is that thing? You know, is this kind of weird little paper mache head sitting there that the film was based on this alien? Anyway, very funny. <laughs> now, there was a stunt earlier that it looked like there was an Asian man in a wig when you bounced off yeah, the well, spaceship and rolled. Yeah, yeah. and that. Yeah. Yeah, they, yeah, they they were looking, but you'll see, we all get doubled. Cynthia got doubled a lot in that fight. I get, you know, there's some places. They don't do it all the time. I'll tell you why. And Jackie hmm. Chan was the one that told me this because when we were doing City Hunter, which I know we're going to talk about, I said to Jackie at one stage, why, why are you doubling me? I said, my timing is better than some of your guys. 
And he explained that the only way that a lot of their local stunt people actually make some reasonable money is when they double the guaylo or one of us <laughs> west. So whenever yeah. there's an opportunity back on or whatever, they would often put them in. Of course, there's also like that flipping kind of stuff. Could I do it? Probably. The problem that people need to understand is if you're, say, a third of the way through a fight and that's the particular action, there's a huge opportunity that you could get injured, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's wrecking a shoulder, an elbow, twisting an ankle. And, of course, that means the whole shoot stops. So a lot of the times it's not always about whether you can do it or not, it's whether or not they feel it's safe enough for you to do without jeopardizing the shoot. So, you know, and, and, and that's aside, there's some high falls and ridiculous stunts that I wouldn't want to do in a fit. And why should you? And why should you rob a stunt man? You know, that's his living or her living. So it, it kind of works out pretty well all around. Yeah. Because uh, that was only a few minutes of screen time. But how long did the shoot take? Oh, mate, you're right. This is a long time. When we say Magic Christmas 1986, <laughs> and we, so we would have shot it in 1984 or five. Look, they they always take, I, I would say we would have been around because the next cliff you've got is where I'm fighting, you know, both of them a little more extensive, or, or an inside fight scene, I'm sorry, with um, with this Wong Mei Mei. That you would probably take a week to do a fight like that. Okay. I would think, you know, um, you know, also understand in Hong Kong, there's no unions, there's no overtime. <laughs> they, don't, they don't have to worry about, like, when you shoot in America or Australia, you've got to, after you go after a 10-hour day or a 12-hour day, it's it costs a fortune for crew and cast. It doesn't exist there. So time is uh, not really a worry for them. So they will keep you around on set as long as it takes to get the job done. You know, and if it takes weeks and weeks longer than they anticipate, then they will just do that. And that was directed by Wong Jing. Wong Jing was uh, was wonderful, and I really liked Wong Jing. It's through him that I I got to work on City Hunter. Um, yeah, so you know, we 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 established a good relationship through having worked on Magic Crystal together. Nice, because uh, I think Cynthia said that. She had no idea what the script was supposed to say, she, and they just told her to move her mouth and then they'd dub her in anyway in Chinese. Is that the same for you, or did you have an understanding? No, yeah, all, of them, all of them were like that. You know, you it's it's I tell you this, there's a you couldn't really plan or practice anything because first of all, you wouldn't know what the choreography was going to be until they showed it to you. And basically you get in front of camera and away you go. And this is before digital, you know, this is all on film. And you would then just do it as you'd basically rehearse on camera until you got it right. The dialogue was the same. You know, I always laugh because I remember one day I'm in makeup and Wong Jing's lying on a, it's almost like on a banana lounge. You'd, you'd lie out by your swimming pool, you know, get a bit of sun with a drink. And he's giggling away because he's writing that day's script. I mean, they literally didn't even know what the next day's dialogue and script was going to be. So you really, yes, they would give you approximate length the dialogue should be and you could just say whatever you wanted knowing that it was <laughs> going to be dubbed in Mandarin or Cantonese. So it was quite spontaneous in a way because, again, you didn't have to stress over, oh, do I know my lines because there weren't any <laughs> until you're on the set. Um, and away you went, you know. So And even the fight scenes as well, you know, it's not like you could rehearse a whole lot of stuff. It was rehearsed on camera. And you got what you got, and they would move on when they got the take that they actually liked, you know. Yeah. Whereas, <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm saying there for the uninitiated that if if I was going to do a film in America, you would have a master. The fight would be totally worked out. You would do a master of the whole fight. You would then go in and cover over the shoulder inserts of certain hits or aspects of the fight. But... <clears throat> That's because I knew what it was going to be, but doesn't exist with these movies, including the Jackie Chan movies. It's just right. as they go, they figure out how long, it, how much longer they want the fight to be, et cetera, et cetera, and you just figured it out and went for it, uh, <laughs> which is why they take so long to shoot. Right, yeah. Okay, thanks. Let's have a look what's next. 
Talking of which, it is City Hunter. <laughs> I think City Hunter was 1993, and again, Wong Jing, same director. Right. And th this was one of the, you know, the manga movies, as you know, was Jackie was trying to appeal to a slightly younger audience than even he would normally appeal to. It was a little more comedic. And Wong Jing was known for his comedic direction. And you, you can see a lot of that, like when I punch him here and the tears cut running down his face, you know. <laughs> so it's always a, just a strange mixture of comedy and, and violence and everything else. But <laughs> I, I, I had also realized when we did Twinkle Twinkle Lucky Stars, which I know we'll get to, that you're really a caricature in these movies. If you went in thinking that I'm going to play a very serious bad guy, then I'm on the wrong movie set and I'm in the wrong movie. You had to just, you had to just go along for the ride, make it larger than life because that was the fun of being involved and in being part of a, a movie like this. Even swinging these, you know, there's a stage here. I looked like the mad professor. They didn't want it to look like Carly or a screamer. It's like just, Look at this with the tears. I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Plus, it's a massive set as well. Yeah, no, incredible set. This was on a, a, this was the inside of a ship. You know, when we shot this stuff, we went to Tokyo, Tokyo Harbor and shot all the externals for this particular film. Now, this was a set, of course, you know, back in Hong Kong. Um, that they built, and you talk about uh, film time. I think I got a feeling this this fight took something like six and a half weeks. Now again, they're doing sort of other stuff as well, but that's that's how long the whole thing took to do. So gives you an idea because it, it, look at the set and look at the size of it, and look at the scale of it, and mm. you know a lot of Jackie and the stunties would come in and pull out stunt mattresses and lie down and then just think about what the next moves would be, whether it took an hour or three hours or whatever, and up you go. And I've said this a lot, and I'm s s serious when I say that we're on the set sometimes 18 hours a day, seven days a week, Oof. just sometimes just lying around waiting for the next moves. And, you know, again, you would rehearse in front of Cameron and where you went. <laughs> but But very funny. And... Like the thrill for me, you know, I didn't get to see a lot of what else they shot is going and seeing the cut film, the end result. I think I saw this in Los Angeles at the American film market and it was just hilarious, you know, some <laughs> of the, the the gags, like all this sort of stuff. It's it's so smart, you know what I mean? Like Jackie and those boys and the Hong Kong boys, they're just the best at using props because you mm. can only say throw many kicks and punches you know, we've got two arms and two legs, so it's all about what's in the environment that you can use. And uh, I mean, look at these carrying on here. <laughs> and I think I've said before also for those losing, Jackie got a lot of his gags from the old silent movies. He told me he had a complete library of Laurel and Hardy, The Three Stooges, Buster Keaton, all these people. If anyone ever saw the old black and white action movies, as it were, that were a lot of times comedies, the stunts were amazing, considering they probably didn't even have knee or elbow pads back then or all the mod cons we have. And he got a lot of ideas. Like you would see, you know, Charlie Chaplin trying to get away from a bad guy and he'd be picking up, a, going under a ladder or picking up an umbrella. In other words, is what, what can I use that's in the room that will add a bit of variety to the action? And uh, that's again. He he told me that he wanted to be uh, people to be able to turn the sound off and the music off, and still just enjoy the comedic physicality of the fights, which you know, which is what he does. I mean, look at this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, there's the cable lifting him up, you know, in the middle. But I mean, it's just it's well, hilarious. <laughs> yes, he's taking the right old beating, and not even a mark on him. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Um. Oh. Now you're across. There's a scene where he ends up with a helmet on. He was so nervous when I smacked him across the head that I was going to miss. I was too, and I thought, oh, my God, if I wrap this around Jackie Chan's face, I'm going to be in all sorts of trouble. But <laughs> yes. I didn't. <laughs> Might accidentally hit the hole in his head. Yeah, look at this. 
like sees things like this just do gymnastics. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. Whoa. But yeah, it took a long time to shoot this fight. And of course, your your English compatriot Gary Daniels was also in this in this movie. Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They they wanted me to see myself on screen and suddenly go, oh, I'm okay, you know. <laughs> But like I said, it's it's you're a caricature, you know, and that, and that's the fun of it, you know. It's just comedic action. <laughs> yes. But but it's boy, you had to be in shape going into these though. You know, yes, you, I can see this. Go in a cock because you just wouldn't last, you know. It's nonstop. <laughs> We've got about two or three of you falling on your back. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> with not knowing what's behind you. <laughs> Mine. <Don't. laughs> yeah. Obviously, it wasn't me, but that wasn't me landing. <laughs> ah. <laughs> uh oh. Yeah. Look at all the pyrotechnics. I mean, they were huge as well. You know, this is inside. Yeah. One would wonder how we didn't get incinerated, but we made it. <laughs> Yeah, very lucky. To... <laughs> yeah. Going full James Bond and blowing up the, the set. Right. Uh, uh, more Jackie Chan in uh, The Mr. Nice Guy. So this one was shot, as you know, in Melbourne, Australia, as well Ooh. as it's in uh, sort of wine country. Uh, Sam Hong was the director, and obviously because I'd done Twinkle Twinkle Lucky Stars and Millionaire's Express... Samo was after me to play the uh, the bad guy in this, and and again, just to be able to shoot in my own hometown was was just a thrill by itself. The only funny part is like the hair and the suit. I mean, I said to Jackie when they wanted to slick my hair back, I said, Jackie, can't I just be an ordinary looking bad guy? He said, No, <laughs> no, 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 we've got to slick your hair back. And they gave me a cigar. I nearly passed out so many times in the beginning because there's scenes where he wanted me to keep it in my mouth and keep puffing on it and i've never smoked you know and oh I'm my god ask you about this <laughs> and all this by the way this this you know him being held by my men you know with with rubber sort of uh straps and everything like that it was supposed to lead to us having a big climactic fight in the end but i think we went something like two months over schedule <laughs> and the producers just basically said no that's it shut it down Hence, in the end of this movie, I ended up getting mowed down by a mining truck. And uh, it was it was a bit of a disappointment because, you know, it was supposed to be, well, everybody wanted to see Giancarlo, who my, what well, that was my name in this movie, getting his ass kicked. And unfortunately, we didn't get to do that. But it was, again, it's still a lot of fun. This whole house they built from scratch, all to specs to suit Crazy. the the. the size of the mining truck that eventually goes through and flattens the whole thing. And also I was told that the, even with the mining truck, all they knew is Jackie wanted to do destroy something with one of these huge mining trucks, but they hadn't even figured out story-wise what that would be or why it's even in the story, which again is very typical of, of a lot of these movies. You know, they just kind of make it up as they go. <laughs> I'm sure having a rope around your neck is very safe as well. <laughs> yeah. oh, you, you know, you learn to look after yourself. I've I, I, I got to tell you that much. You, yeah. you never assume that anybody's actually got total safety on you. You know, it's one of the things you learn. There's, there's things that you, you need to know what you're about to do on a film like that because, again, in Hong Kong, it's very cavalier. It's, you know, if you do a film in Australia or, or America, there's incredible safety precautions. You know, they have safety officers. They figure out what could possibly go wrong, and then they basically make plans to safeguard against all of that. Whereas Hong Kong, it, it just it is what it is. You know, I, I did a film, uh, the first film, Twinkle Twinkle, which I think you've got stuff of. Mm. When we did that, I remember being, you know, we had to go to... Um, 
one of the big parks and they said they were doing another movie and they're going to basically blow the top three floors off a huge, well, it was a, almost a block that was due to be raised to the ground, you know, due to be flat. And then anyway, there were three floors of massive, massive explosions. You've got people in the parks doing their Tai Chi and everything. And I'm standing there with a few of them. Uh, they had seven cameras on this whole incident. This is in Hong Kong proper. The explosions go off, and I'm, I started to see people are running everywhere, especially the people in the park who didn't know anything about <laughs> this, and they've basically got a couple of crew that would pick up a bit of camera equipment, throw it in the car. They, I started to say, oh, that was pretty, and I get grabbed and pulled in the car. You know why? Because they hadn't told anybody they were going to do it. And all you could hear were sirens, police sirens and fire engines coming down. There was even an article in the paper the next day referring to a possible terrorist. And this is before even terrorism was a thing of note. I mean, you know, they mm -hmm. hadn't told us that because they knew if they'd asked permission, they wouldn't be allowed to. So they thought, well, we'll just do it. And, and <laughs> I think the authorities, when they were told it was actually Jackie Chan because he's basically got the keys to the city, they... <laughs> sort of let it ride, but I thought, oh, my God, how, how crazy is that, you know? A whole yeah. bloody block going up in, in smoke. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> it's good to be the king. Yes. <laughs> so that was, oh, then we get to Under the Gun. I was going to ask, okay. there's not a Blu-ray release of this. I couldn't find one. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't even know. Under the Gun, I think we shot that when? 1984 or something? Uh, 94? 94, yeah. Yeah, it was released in 1995. This was one that I was a producer on with a friend of mine, Paul Curry. Um, Matthew George was the director. We, we just wanted to do something locally. Paul, by the way, that was one of his first productions. He went on to be a producer of Hacksaw Ridge with Mel Gibson and, you know, some other quite big shoots. But this was fun. It was very, um, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. We just found a location that all takes place pretty much in a nightclub. And uh, the backstory to this, as you know, Kathy Long, we brought Kathy Long, who had done a few movies at that stage and was also world kickboxing champion. And uh, Kathy came out to work in this film. And the, the other thrill for me was I got to work with a whole lot of Aussie martial artists, including Tino Seberano in a fight scene I do with this accountant, and he's using a cane. Tino was my very first karate instructor back in the wow. mid-60s. So, you know, it was such a thrill for me to be able to actually get my my first sensei, you know, as it were, on, on set with me doing a fight scene. And the script actually called for me to beat him up. And I remember saying, I can't do it. I can't. I'm the student. I can't do it. Not even on film. So I ended up shooting him in the ankle or something like that and doing, <laughs> doing him away. But it, it was just so much fun to be able to work with, uh, with Tino in this film. I think the fight scene you're going to show is with a guy called Sam Greco. Sam Greco was a world Kyokushin champion in the K1 kickboxing champion, close, close friend, an amazing martial artist. So, again, we had a lot of fun doing this. Cool. Uh, it's a bit of a fire stunt in this one as well. Yeah, you, it, you, the backstory to that, you know, his idea with that was, and you would know who Bay Logan is. Bay Logan is, uh, you know, based in Hong Kong. He's directed and produced a lot of films, knows everything about Bruce Lee and all the rest of it. But he was the one I said, got any ideas for this fight? And he said, I know, set fire to your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like an out of the cuff idea that we decided to use just to make this a little funny. There's Kathy Long, uh, in, oh, yeah. you know, with blonde hair. Oh, got ball smashes, fire. <laughs> You're always wearing a nice suit in all these clips. <laughs> in the front, yes, I am. Yeah. Hey, getting back here, by the way, I was going to mention for that Mr. Nice Guy, that pinstripe suit was another thing. I said, this is a horrible suit. Jackie actually walked up to me during shooting. He said, oh, fucking horrible suit. I said, well, you're a producer. <laughs> Do something about it. He just laughed and walked off. So I've got slick back hair, a cigar, and a horrible pinstripe suit. 
And the <laughs> character was described as a New York mafia. I said, yeah, a blonde Australian, that's pretty good casting. That's close <laughs> enough. <laughs> it's called acting, isn't it? <laughs> so. Right. Uh, now we get to the twinkle, twinkle, little star, where you are Caucasian hitman, I believe. Yes. Um, and, and, yeah, I got to work with Yazioki uh, Kurata, Japanese actor. Uh, you know, Kurata san had done something like 40 movies in Hong Kong at that stage, and he's such a gentleman. I was so thrilled to work with him. Of course, this is the incredible uh, Sammo Hung, who was a director. Mm. Uh, Sammo Stuhl, and I'll say it again, is the most amazing fight choreographer, action director I've ever worked with. And look at the guy. Look at the build on him and the stuff he can do and the way he moves. Uh, he just blew me away, you know, and he, he's – we we, <laughs> we just formed a really, really great relationship. In fact, Jackie and – that was my first movie in Hong Kong. Um, as uh, And they took me shopping and looking for cameras and Sam would take me, you know, to dim sum and all this sort of stuff. You know, we'd go for different food. But it was. But look at the way he moves. I mean, it's yeah. it's fantastic. He's very very powerful. You can yeah. tell, even though it's fight choreography, you can tell if somebody can really throw a punch or a kick. And right. he's he's very very powerful, and especially his turning back kick. Um, it's funny here. <laughs> but that was him going through the window. That wasn't a stunt double, and it was real glass too. Like they didn't even have breakaway glass for that. Yeah. So, pretty impressive stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's a hell of a game. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy stuff. This is where you've got to be hurt. Now, remember when I said to me, you know, you hurt him. He says, oh, my body's all numb. You know, that was, uh, it became a bit of a phrase for me after this. You know, my body, well, I can't feel anything on my body. That's the one time they used the double there because it was both feet straight under the chin. I thought, oh, no, I'll, get my, I'll break my neck. But everything yeah, else. Was, and I tell you, this film was a reason I ended up getting like five movies in Hong Kong, just because I was in good shape. I would take all the bumps and the falls, like all this stuff. I said, "No, I'm good to do it," and they really respected that, and uh, they knew it. And, and I got I, like this here, this stunt that you're seeing there. I remember when Jack and when Samo was explaining what he was going to do. I was literally looking around for the stunt double. Because I thought, there's no way this guy's <laughs> going to do that. But, yes. of course, he did it like 20 times. This was bare-fisted uppercut under the chin. They wanted actual contact. I had a little bit of oh, cotton right. wool to put in my teeth because I didn't want to uh, crack my teeth. So that was trial by fire of doing that movie. Um, but what an experience. Um, it was just... Uh, I mean, it was so full-on. That, that took about two and a half weeks to shoot that one fight. Right. But, uh, again, it just um, – to work with Kurata, as I said, he he was the one I, – I credit Kurata in, in a certain way with me getting more work in that that particular fight. After a couple of days, he could see I was getting quite frustrated because the choreography is very different there, the timing, the way they'll throw a punch. Um, and, he said, and, and I remember talking to him and he said, Rich – he said, let me give you advice. If you want to do these movies, he basically said, don't say anything. He said, this is their set, their movie. Just do it as, if they want. And often you would do 30 takes of something just to get the shot they wanted. He said, don't say anything, just do it. And I, and I remember taking that advice. And that was a reason because I don't have any capabilities, you know, better than a whole lot of other martial arts could be doing it. But they realized... I would shut up. I would do it 30 times if we took it. I wouldn't complain about the bumps and the knocks and everything else. And particularly for whatever reason, as Jackie had said in a little clip he said about me, that I had the timing that worked for him. He said right. a lot of fighters had speed and had great kicks and all that, but if they didn't have the timing that suited his style of choreography, it just wouldn't work. Now, I didn't. I didn't just suddenly devise that. It was probably by accident through the training I'd done beforehand. I just had the timing that suited what he was doing. So it, it just all fell into place. But 
an incredible experience because again I, I you know 18 hours a day that was trial by fire as well on that set realizing how difficult it was to do an action movie in Hong Kong you know if you I went over thinking oh, I'll probably work 10 hour days get the weekend off have a look around Hong okay. Kong oh no, fuck me holiday. no it was like seven days a week you know when the fighting stuff started but again it's it's in hindsight that I look back and I go oh man just to be a part of that whole era you you just it doesn't get better than that you know it doesn't get better because somebody asked me once how did you feel heading over to work with jackie chan and sama hong i said well i didn't really know much about them you know mm. it's not like i was a big follower of hong kong movies uh, so i said it was just another gig for me you know it's just a job it's only 20 years or 30 years later when you see the faces of the people who follow that and their eyes like this, oh, my God, you work with Samo Hong and Jackie Chan and uh, people like that, 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 you, that you go, wow, yeah, that was an incredible experience. And hmm. remember with, uh, with this film, um, Michelle Yeoh, you know, she was in there. There, was, there were people that were very, very at the beginning of these incredible careers, as I had mentioned, Andy Lau, so again, it's it's it was an incredible opportunity for me that I feel like today so thankful that I was able to to be involved and and be a part of working with again Jack and Sema, who are the actual absolute maestros of uh, action movie. Yeah, yeah, so they are. <clears throat> and ah, now here we go, bit of a different one, Kick Fighter. Kick Fighter was uh, 1989, Tony Maharaj. He was a guy that did some films under Roger Corman's manner. I had done right. a film called Equalizer 2000, which is where I met um, uh, Tony Maharaj. And again, it was just it, the biggest thrill for me was being able to get Benny Okita's Benny the Jet, absolute legend, undefeated yes. record as a kickboxer. Benny's actually coming to Australia next month and I'm hosting him. Uh, Keanu Reeves is uh, producing a documentary on Benny's life. Mm. So we'll get to be on the mat together. I started training with Benny in like 1979, 1980. We did Force 5 together in 1981. So I was thrilled that, you know, when I asked Benny if he would come and, and do this film with me. The funny part even with this is I'm supposed to be a street fighter that doesn't really have martial arts ability, and they wanted me to keep my hands down. I remember if, anyone who knows Benny, if you, not many of you guys would have been in the ring with him, but when he sets his, when he puts his hands up and sets his gaze on you, it's like it's like being in a shark tank, you know. And I remember I, as soon as we got in the ring, my hands came up like this, and they said, "Oh no, no." no. <laughs> Keep your hands down like this. It was just, it's just a feeling I never forgot when I thought, oh God, he's going to think I'm, I'm challenging him for the title. <laughs> I'm forgetting the movie. <laughs> the, the, you know what's hard for, for this? When we did Force Five with Benny, Benny was an absolute physical wreck. He said, oh. I, I had no idea. He said, I don't pull things. He said, my job is to hit things, whether it's the bag <laughs> or the other person, and to throw sidekicks and all that and with power but not make contact, just absolutely mm. wrecked for a while. <laughs> but fun. I did quite a number of films in the Philippines, and, of course, that being one of them. And, God, I loved it. You know, again, it was like it's just like being in a big, big kid in the sandpit, you know, with all these toys. And so much of it was very little money, not much of a budget. You just came up with ideas as as the movie went through and everybody kicked in to make the movie work for whatever it, you know, was supposed to be. And uh, it, it was just, again, fantastic memories. Filipino people were just absolutely uh, delightful. It's been a long time since I've been there, but, boy, boy, I had fun back in the day. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, if... You and Benny had got into a real fight back then. How long would it? Do you think it would last? Oh, I, I, film I, I, last like ten minutes or more. But a real fight, as in what yeah. in the ring yeah. or in the street? It would be the one. <laughs> Let's say in the well, street. If you and no, Benny went at it. No, in in look, and I I know how to fight. You know, I I was a personal bodyguard for twenty five years, but I will tell you, I would still say pound for pound, Benny is the toughest guy that I've ever trained with or work with if we got in the ring it's you know i'm i'm out of there in round one 
uh, <laughs> he, he, he's the real deal, you know, the power and everything, the technique and the determination. And it's more about his heart, you know. Mm. I, I've often said you, I believe you could cut both of Benny's arms and legs off he would still crawl after you and try and bite you to death. I mean, that's that's how much of a warrior Benny is. And he also had, you know, he grew up with street gangs with his brothers. He's, he knows what the street is like, aside from being an incredibly skilled martial artist. So, no, I, I, I would be... I wouldn't even. I wouldn't even say I'd last. You know, no, forget about it. <laughs> I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> he does look no, like I'm, I'm incredible <laughs> respect for, for Sensei Benny. He's, he's one of the few role models I have. More than anything, because he actually lives what he teaches. He's, you know, I have a saying that it's not the two hours on the mat that matters. It's the twenty-two hours off the mat. Like a lot of people will put on their costumes and they'll walk on, they'll be all spiritual and they'll have all this gaff they talk about. And then off the mat, they're complete dicks, whether it's with family or friends or whatever. I'm not saying everybody. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I think it's important if you were to call yourself a martial artist, you have the qualities of honor and integrity and, you know, and loyalty along with the martial skills. And, and Benny's absolutely represents that to me. He's very spiritual. He's principled, you know, and he's still, as I said, Benny's, I'm 74 now. Benny's, I think, 70 he would be. Uh, and he's still out there teaching seminars, coming out here. He's still a doer. He's not a talker. You know, Benny, one of Benny's favorite sayings when, when training, and I've heard him say this when people would come into the Jet Center. And I started training with Sensor Benny in, in 1980. Uh, met him through Chuck Norris, and of course we ended up with Force Five together, aside from Kick Fighter that was later on. But people would come in and say, "Oh, you know, we, we do da 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 da," and they'd start describing what they do as martial arts. Benny would say, uh, "He said, don't tell me, surprise me." <laughs> <laughs> and I think that get in the ring and move around. I'm, I'm not interested in what you say you can do, you know. Right. And and I, I I really respect that. It's it's all about the doing. Yeah, he does that. He certainly is tough. <laughs> He's yeah. got it in his there. Just look at his eyes, you can see. Yep. All right. Uh, now, Billy Blanks, I think is the next one, isn't it? Tough and deadly. Yeah, God, you know, when I looked at that, I almost had to, I'd, I'd forgotten I'd even do, done this movie. Uh, <laughs> tough and deadly was 1995. <clears throat> it's my role, but... Again, you know, Billy Billy was a legend back in the day, as you know, you know, invented Tybo. My my wife used to do yeah. Tybo classes with uh, with Billy, you know, a phenomenal martial artist. And, uh, you know, that was a good fight. I mean, it was old school, you know, more of a mm. brawl than a martial yeah. arts fight. And, you know, I, I, I was very happy with the way that turned out. And, again, I don't think I've seen this since I shot it. So when you sent me this clip, I went, oh, my God, look at that. I couldn't even remember it. But, you know, very, very, very skilled and lovely, lovely man, Billy. You know, he's a, he was a real gentleman and, again, just a incredibly skilled. As you know, he was a, like, champion points fighter back in the day. So mm -hmm. he, he had all the goods. I, you you see, I'm not doing so well in that fight, especially then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, well. <laughs> Story, story of my life, Gareth. You know, there you go. Speaking <laughs> over a balcony. See you later, Richard. Yeah, thank you. Thanks you. Thanks for coming in. <laughs> now we get to Millionaires Express. Millionaires or Shanghai Express. Yeah, and again, uh, phenomenal thing. We shot a lot of this in Thailand as well ah. as in Hong Kong. And um, incredible martial artists in this. You know, Yin Bill, as you know, there's Jackie, there's Samo, and there's Yin Bill. You know, one is brother, one is big brother, and and uh, one is young brother. But again, getting to fight Kurata again, who you saw me uh, with uh, partnering up with in Twinkle Twinkle Lucky Stars, not him. He was a Korean martial artist, this gentleman. But right. the main fight I got to do with Kurata was was just fantastic because I just love him to death. And um, I was trying to think. Uh, Oh, of course, Yukio Oshima, you saw just before. She became a huge star. 
Yukio Oshima was the young lady that you saw fighting earlier. Now, this is again Kurata oh. Sun. This was a tough film, and I'll tell you the backstory with this. I had just done a film in the Philippines, and I got a staph infection. And when I got to Hong Kong, I said, oh, man, how's this going to go? Well, it took three weeks for us to start the fight. By the time we started this fight, you can see I'm wearing cavalry. Go figure, by the way. Cynthia and I are both dressed up as U.S. cavalry people. I have no idea how we end up there. But anyway, that's okay. <laughs> but I remember one of the first kicks I had to throw at Kurata was this round kick to the head. And, of course, they don't want you to pull a the kick. They want it as powerful as you can. He was using both forearms to block. Well, I had the cavalry boot. I nearly passed out. I nearly fainted. I took my boot oh. off. My boot was full of blood and pus from this staph infection that I had in my knee that took me to hospital and cleaned it all out and got all the rest of it out. And on we went and had to continue with the fight. But that was not fun. I tell you, when, when I threw that kick, because I thought I could get through it, and when he blocked with both forearms, oh, my God. And, of course, yeah, so uh, there you go. But but again, you know, have incredible martial arts in that. I think um, uh, who else was in that that of really no showed you Kada? Oh, Bolo Bolo Young was in that as well. You know, in some aspect of the film, D Way or Dick Way was another <laughs> incredible. Uh, he was a Taekwondo player. You know, did a, many many Hong Kong films. They ended up getting uh, D-Way to come to, uh, to the Philippines and work with me. It, it, I think, uh, what was it called? Not Another Mistake, it was yeah, called. Yeah, Vietnam. Like, like, yeah. Film that, yeah, Vietnam film, and D-Way was in that one. So, again, fantastic experience, you know, and, and Cynthia and I had a good time on that. Though, you know, on the horses wasn't fun. They had wind machines. When my horse, we couldn't see two bloody inches in front of our faces. We had no idea what was going on, but there you go. Still another good <laughs> Yeah. Yes. <laughs> sort of magic in the tree. Yeah, we got the one more, and we're back to the magic crystal. What are you up to this time? Yeah, well, this will be inside when I'm fighting Cynthia and Wong Mei Mei. Wong Mei Mei was amazing. She's the, playing the mother of this child in this. That's her there. And again, just, just fantastic choreography, I thought, you know, and very complex. You know, when you end up mm. doing this with her was one thing, but when they had me fighting Cynthia and her at the same time, I don't think I'd done anything like that before. So it was, a, a, again, a, a, a great experience for me. You know, it sort of lets you know what's possible. This is the, by the way, this whole fight was where uh, Cynthia cracked me in the head with a sword. Because we'd been shooting 16 hours. I think I'm ducking. She thinks she's hitting in the right place with the sword. I had right. a cut above my eye that just missed my eyeball. They took me to hospital. They didn't want to give me any anesthetic because they didn't want my eye to swell up. So they put eight stitches in it, and I'm back on the set, and off we go continuing the fight again. So uh, <laughs> there you go. You know, that's that's Hong Kong movie making. You just, you just get get on with it. There are yeah. always some sorts of injuries. This is the move that I was telling you about. It was so <laughs> weird for me to do this move, and Cynthia just cracked up with me trying to figure that move out. But anyway, it was uh, it certainly it makes you look more powerful. powerful. <laughs> yeah. But all, all this stuff. Now, this again, this is all against just with Cynthia, but some of the moves later when we're on the couch and everything, it was, it was quite in intricate and stuff to do. So, yeah. Because what is that sword made of? Is it, it is metal? That it's it's still it's still metal, but it's that very you know the way the a lot of the wushu swords are and everything. Mm. If you get hit with it, it's certainly going to cut you open. See, all this sort of yeah. stuff was was just a lot of fun though, but quite quite difficult, you know. And again, thank God I was always in shape going into this. Otherwise, I would have wouldn't have made it off the set. <laughs> you got two swords. Great. As I said, Wong Mei Mei, you know, this lady was so good, you know, and uh, very, very talented. There we go. <laughs> Amazing stuff. That's it, is it? That was the clips. Yep. All 10. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> look, um, 
That, and thank you for putting those together because at least it, there's quite a cross section of stuff. Look, you know, I would say th there's there's a lot of people like you look at somebody now with action like, um, um, well, even back in the day, Cynthia or Yun Bill and that some amazing kickers, you know, Scott mm. Atkins, people like that that can. Michael J. White, they're incredible martial artists. Um, that was never my style. You know, when, when we trained in karate even, it was more when we, Bob Jones and I was a partner, we started a style called Zendo Kai back in 1970. Mainly Bob and I was his right-hand man. We were working doors. We were working as bouncers. I worked as a bodyguard for 25 years. So a lot of the emphasis of the training we did was, well, <clears throat> would it actually work in the street? What would work for real reality-based training as opposed right. to trying to kick light bulbs, you know, off a ceiling with high kicks and everything. That was the emphasis. Because as you know, yes, high kicking is all good, but you would you would be an idiot to try and kick somebody in the head in a street fight, especially there's a few people. So yes. you understand? So I'm just saying that there's so many more or better skilled martial artists, but I had an opportunity to, bring a more of a roughness to the fights, you know, a yes. little, little rougher around the edges in, instead of making it very clean and very clinical. Because the one thing I did know in real fights that no matter how you looked in the gym, it was going to look quite rough and untidy if you would ever have to get into it, you know, out in the streets. So that became my style. And I, it, I think it just worked for me. Octagon was different, you know, getting to use – the sword katana and, and using the sai was an opportunity to display more as a traditional martial artist. But looking at those clips just reminds me of the opportunity again to to display different styles. The Hong Kong movies had their own style. Right. Even fighting with Benny, kickboxing style, more of an American kickboxing style in the Philippines, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so it's it's been a fun, fun journey. That's all I can say. And again, I just feel so, so fortunate to have been able to do this as a living for the past, what, 45 years. You know, I started, mm. well, my, the first movie I did was in 1976. That was in Australia, a film called Last of the Knuckle Men. It was about opal miners in Outback yeah. Australia. And they used to have these basically no rules fights for real. And it was about that, and I ended up doubling an actor in uh, that that one. So that was my first foray into film, and the next being, of course, Octagon, which uh, you know I did a few films with Chuck. Then I got auditioned for the lead role in Force Five with uh, the legendary Joe Lewis, Bong Su Han, Benny the Jet, Okidas, and. I thought, wow, what a great way to make a living. I can still be a martial artist and actually get paid. So <laughs> you know, away we end. My, my, my big th somebody asked me once about do you have any regrets? I think they mean career-wise or movies, meaning a lot of the films I did were, were quite low budget, but I, I could honestly say, no, I don't have any regrets. Hmm. I had an acting teacher that asked me, said to me, Richard, you need to say no to going to Thailand, the Philippines, and Hong Kong. You need to hold out for some of these bigger, better A-list movies. First of all, I always thought if I got offered a role, I thought that might be the last role I ever get offered. So there was the fear of that. Mm. The second thing is I know today that even back then, my passion wasn't being in movies. My passion was just trying to be the best martial artist I could be. The film was just a way to make an income to allow me to spend more time training and being in the dojo because I knew if I was that passionate about acting, then I would have been in acting class five days a week instead right. of in the dojo six or seven days a week. So looking at that whole realization made me feel very comfortable with the journey I took. I met some amazing people. I had incredible fun. I've worked in so many countries, including Kazakhstan. I even did a movie for four months in Kazakhstan, Borat country. And <laughs> you know, so, so the experiences through being involved in the whole entertainment industry, it's, it's just given me a life that I couldn't even imagine had Chuck not given me the opportunity in the octagon and opened the doors and made me realize, well, here's a, here's a possible career direction. Right. So, uh, yeah. Well, it's been and wonderful it's still, to be on screen. You know, anyway. 
Yeah, we're still working. You know, I've got a few mm-hmm. projects coming yes. up uh, one at the end of the year and uh, early next year. It's a film that, uh, that I, I shouldn't even say because so many times you end up saying so-and-so's yeah. in this film and then it doesn't happen and people say, well, how did that film turn out? And you've got to <laughs> say because it's it's difficult to get any sort of project up these days, you know, to yeah. get the money, to get the financing. But I'm hopeful. I mean, there's an offer in that Jason Statham and he loves the the idea of the movie. Is there a commitment? I don't believe so yet. But that's one of the leads I do with him in a film, which would be amazing. And another one called um, uh, Sacrifice. It's a complete drama. I'm playing a military man with PTSD. He's got a you know a son and a daughter. He's an old school Anzac, meaning you know the Australian diggers, you know from World War One and Two. He's out out of Ooh. that stock, and it's a drama, and I'm so excited about it, um, nice. just because I get to do and play a character that scares the daylight out of me. Because I don't even know how I'd play it, and that's what I want to do now. I want yeah. I want things. It's all at this stage of my life, giving me a bit of a challenge, you know. So. So it, it, it continues on, martial arts continues on, still teaching seminars, still loving, loving the opportunity to learn whatever I can on every waking day. So what can I say, mate? Life is good. Very well. <laughs> Lovely to hear that. So we've got a couple of questions from yes. some of my friends. Uh, Barry asks that, well, he says, Norton is a fabulous martial artist for a start. So you got that. Thank you. And then Thank you. <laughs> and uh, uh, he's got two questions. What, Ask him what it was like making Equalizer 2000. Well, that was my first uh, seen, uh, film in the Philippines with Sirio Santiago. And everybody, I'm sure, has heard of Roger Corman. Roger Corman was famous for doing the lower budget genre movies. He even had John Wayne in movies, if you can believe it. Uh, <laughs> Sylvester Stallone. The, there's a yeah. litany of amazing names that you would never believe had worked in films that sometimes were shot in two and three days. Like <laughs> Mormon producer Sirio Santiago d- directed a couple of hundred movies in the Philippines. So that was that was uh, a, a, an exciting film for me. Um, just to be the lead, you know what I mean, in, in a film like that. And again, I just I made so many friends in in the Philippines. The fun part for me again was as i've said with a lot of the other films you're pretty much making it up as you go yes there was a script in this case but a lot of the vehicles that have five mechanics falling everywhere because wheels would fall off or floors would drop out of vehicles and stuff like that so you're sort of fixing them up on the way some of the stunts i look back now and so even with the equalizer and you know i've often said i don't even know how i'm still alive because you would be running over explosions that were just literally bags of petrol, you know, that they would set off. The the safety protocols didn't really exist. The firearms, a lot of the weapons we used were just rented or hired from the local military base. So the real AK-47s and everything else that you're using with blanks, you've got Filipino stunties, bless their hearts, who have no real training with weapons that are pointing shotguns and and automatic weapons everywhere including in your own face and the fact that nobody yeah got badly injured or died is is amazing to me but (laughs) again you know when i back then when i was doing those you you know when you're younger you're indestructible you know the thought of a a debilitating injury is just not something that enters your mind so I just, you know, driving those cars and everything and uh, doing some of the stunts we did, again, I, would I do it now? I would think no, but back then it was, it was what they say before, it was just like a big kid in a big sandbox with all these adult tools, you know. Yeah. Even that gun in Equalizer 2000, for Adam that's asking, that had a shotgun and a, an Armalite and, and a rocket launch, and believe it or not, the whole thing worked. I mean, a local armor armor built that it was actually a working weapon as amazing that sounds so that was pretty fun yeah oh and also the other thing about uh equalizer was having robert patrick who people would know from terminator 
Robert Patton. That was one of his first movies that uh, he was the bad guy in Equalize. And Robert, Robert was out in Australia a couple of months ago and we got to hang out. It was oh, so cool. good to catch up with him. So, uh, yeah, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Because, <laughs> yeah, he's doing uh, tours on motorcycles, doesn't he, now mostly? Yes. Right. Yeah, he's, he's bought a, um, a Harley Davidson franchise. He's actually ah. selling selling motorbikes. Yeah. Makes sense. He's had an amazing career. He's in so much stuff, you know, but again, that was one of his first movies. So fun <laughs> thing. And then the second part of the question, do you have a favorite fight scene with Cynthia? Because of the dozens. <laughs> Probably again, I would say Magic Crystal. Hmm. Just because of the complexity of it. Uh, you know, we've done we've uh, we've done a few. Lady Dragon was, I guess, fun as well. Um yeah, I, 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 again, if I would have to say the favourite, it, pr it probably would be Magic Crystal. Oh, yeah, that was just definitely a good one. Uh, mm. And then last question is from Mika. Uh, what fight, fight scene was the most demanding to shoot? Any and all of the Hong Kong movies. There is, there is nothing more demanding. I don't know what it's like now, by the way. You know, I, oh, yeah. I haven't been back to Hong Kong since... I think the last time I was there was just before the handover, you know, the, oh, right, the, yeah. from the Chinese government and everything. So that's in the late 90s. I believe it's very different. But doing Hong Kong movies back then, you know, if it, it what you they wanted to shoot action and hits and everything else, that what you saw was actually happening. Now, of course, they were using wires and all sorts of stuff and rigs. But a lot of the hits you saw, the facial hits, I told you I got hit with bare-fisted uppercuts and I remember Kolata kicked me in the neck so hard in uh, Millionaire's Express that I had to spend five minutes between takes walking around to shake it off because I remember saying to them, "Can't you? if you put the camera over there, I can react a lot better if I think I'm not going to get smacked in the neck. And I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> So, so the difficulty was the contact, and you know, twinkle, twinkle that I did. I mean, that was Samo was planting me as hard as he could with those sidekicks when he smacked me up against the wall. Yeah. All those sort of hits and but they were they were very very hardcore, and not just the hardcore nature of which again I was fine with. I honestly didn't mind because I was in good shape. I did a lot of full contact sparring, so that wasn't a big deal, but. I think the hardest aspect was the hours, the fact that after two weeks, three weeks of on the set, 18 hours a day, seven days a week, that's going to kill anybody. <laughs> so you would get into a corner and try and get a little bit of sleep in a corner while they're figuring out what you're going to do next. That made it very difficult. Having said that, I have to say that what I also realised that, shit, I was thinking, here's me complaining. These guys like Sam and Jackie are doing this year in, year out, sometimes two and three movies at a time. And I said, mm. i got to just shut up, you know. <laughs> i got to just suck this up and harden up because that's the way they did it, you know. And, and again, I mean, it, I think it was crazy because of the, you know, the chance of injury mm. and everything else and fatigue, but... You know, it, it, remember I said when Cynthia hit me in the eye, that was due to fatigue because she's very good with a sword. As I said, she probably thought she was hitting at the right level. I think I'm ducking the right place. But right. that's that's how accidents happen, you know, with, with when you get that tired, with that sort of intensity. Oh, because yeah. they will literally, Samuel would literally sometimes do as many as 30 takes to get the shot he wanted. The audience see the one take that they use, but they forget how many times it took to get it. And each time you're getting thumped and pounded and you're hitting the ground. I've just had uh, both the left, the right shoulder was done two and a half years ago, total shoulder replacement. The All left right. shoulder is three months in with the humerus bone, total cap put in, new glenoid it's put. And that is literally because of the Hong Kong movies, because of hitting the concrete hundreds of times and smacking into walls and everything else. I chipped all the cartilage off the bone, so it was bone on bone, severe osteoarthritis. Honestly, that's a result of the Hong Kong movies. And again, it's it's fine. I I am okay with it. I'm I'm 74, and I often say, well, if that's the worst I have after what I've been through. I'm oh, yeah. I'm okay with it. You know, <laughs> it, the journey has been worth it. You know, they're battle scars.
<laughs> that's me. So that's it for now. So it's been an absolute honor going through all these clips with you. Yes, thank and you. Thank you very much for putting those up. Again, they're good memories for me. I know it sounds strange, but I, I don't have most of the movies that I've done, and I certainly don't look at them. And <laughs> confronted with this and you get to see it, it, it immediately takes you back to that time, sometimes good times, sometimes bad, you know. But <laughs> it just puts a smile on my face when I get to remember, you know, part of that journey. So uh, oh, it's God. as much fun for me, and I hope I hope people enjoy, you know, yeah, looking at these clips as well and and uh, get some enjoyment out because that's the whole point of movies anyway, isn't it? It's for oh, people exactly. to go into a theatre and get a bit of escapism and uh, get out of the normal rut of their lives and watch Richard Norton getting the shit punched out of him by <laughs> Cynthia or Samo or Jackie or whoever else is around. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you win. Sometimes. <laughs> no, yeah, I've been some good guys too. Yeah, people always say, oh, you're always paying the bad guy. I said, no, China O'Brien 1 and 2, raging on 1 and 2 as a good guy. There's ah, been yes. a few. They tend to remember you as a baddie more. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll let you go and enjoy the rest of your evening, Seth. So Thanks for doing this. Yes, thank you. Enjoyed our, our little chats. And um, cool. yeah, all the very best. And thanks to everybody for uh, tuning in. Yes, that's great.